Okay, so I want to bring you <clears throat> a couple of items I mentioned last week, but they're relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, one is a um, a giant uh, split that's coming in the Methodist Church. You know, the Methodist Church is one of the oldest denominations here uh, in the United States <clears throat> and in Europe, started by the uh, Wesley brothers. Uh, the Methodist Church um, is anticipating a split that was supposed to happen pr- right around COVID. <clears throat> it was when it was officially supposed to split. They're thinking it's going to be something like a 70-30 or 80-20 split. And what that means is uh, there'll be a significant body of Methodist believers that do not affirm um, some more of, some of the more progressive uh, uh, progressive uh, Christian uh, Christians out there in the Methodist Church that basically want the litmus test um, for church membership to be the very thing our culture makes a litmus test, which is um, how if you're going to be fully fully accepting and integrating of uh, of people with different sexual orientations and proclivities. So um, this will be called um, <clears throat> the, ooh, ooh, what is it called? Global Methodist Church. Um, this will be one that honors tradition, um, and there's no other theologically conservative group or denominations being planned to emerge from the United Methodist Church. So they want to stay under the umbrella of Methodism uh, because of the history. Um, this, uh, th- but they're anticipating this happening uh, in the next couple couple of months, I believe. Around two thirds of churchgoers in the U.S. either gave the same percentage of income to their church, or more um, uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. Methodist Church was part of this. I don't know if you knew that we gave a lot. Christians gave a lot during coronavirus. Not just here at First Assembly. We are an anomaly. We give. You'll hear the the numbers today if you haven't heard the numbers that were received for the Sahel Project. They're staggering. <clears throat> Unbelievable. Uh, Russ's first big ask for a uh, for something like that. They're they write. I'm not going to ruin that surprise. But if you come over to the 11 o'clock, he'll be able to tell you. We got uh, three times higher offering in the Wednesday Sahel offering. Um, that that's the Sahel Strip in Africa uh, than Russ had ever had ever received anywhere. So uh, again, um, the generosity of this church is it's it's it is legendary. It sounds mythic, but. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to let you know again by uh, they're, they're saying by at least <clears throat> by March 2020 it should be completely uh, split. Uh, in other words, there'll be another version of the Methodist Church that's happening. People are predicting that um, the Southern Baptists are probably going to split as well, probably coming in 2022 sometime. Um, but the idea, the reason I mention it is because this is exactly the thing we're talking about. Uh, essentials versus non. The non-essentials aren't unimportant. We don't want to say any biblical doctrine is unimportant, but treating something that's non-essential as if it is essential uh, is one of the is one of the issues going on here. <clears throat> I also wanted to bring you one more bit of information um, too that <clears throat> that the intensity of persecution in China has ratcheted up since the election since January. Um, yeah, that's this. It's, I know we just kind of pass over this, but in China, the place where Christianity is exploding, they've really started cracking down in the last three months. Um, there's been thousands of Christians affected. They've started doing house to house where they get the house leader of a house church, and they've actually they're on average questioning them two times over the uh, twice a month now. Um, there've been a couple of church demolitions, at least a dozen church demolitions since January. Um, it's where they just destroyed the building itself. Um, the new Chinese president is not. Christ friendly at all, uh, Xi Jinping. So I just wanted you to keep uh, those Chinese Christians in mind that uh, enjoyed quite a bit of freedom for a while when Christianity was exploding and they had even mega churches there. It looks like they're going back to this uh, to this suppression and control scenario. So <clears throat> yeah, China AIDS research for 2020 confirms China persecution of Christians and those of professing belief exceed incidents reported in the previous year and the year before that. So things have gotten worse. Um, between uh, in the fall and in the new year of uh, 2021. So just remember to keep those Chinese Christians uh, in your prayers and in your hearts and minds because it's going to be really, really important. So <clears throat> today, just to give you a little recap, we uh, have started by looking at how do we determine what's an essential versus a non-essential? What is a, an essential belief versus a non-essential belief? And we used as our template Romans 1 through 8. And we talked about three big areas of uh, one's called uh, justification. How are we justified as sinful people? Uh, and then sanctification, how do we walk out that that deliverance from sin and that eternal fore, foreknowledge, that taste, foretaste of the, of the future? And then glorification, what's going to happen after we've, uh, we've passed on from this mortal coil and we uh, 
uh, get to finally be reunited with our, our Heavenly Father. So we're talking about that, but we're also going to look at some other ways to determine uh, what's an essential versus a non-essential doctrine. I'm going to give you some really, really strong titles. Um, this particular teachings come out of about seven or eight books. Um, but we're also going to look at the creeds, the traditional creeds, and, and a couple of councils as well, so you can get a, a good feel. And hopefully when we're finished with this section, I might have Chris come up and actually preach or deliver a message to you that that where he might show you in real time what treating a non-essential as an essential might be like or why because it's going to be important that in the future you know this, there's a reason we did this on the back side of analyzing progressive christianity right we need to be able to recognize these things and, and and determine whether we're at an authentic or an inauthentic church but just a real quick recap we did this last time uh, or chris did there seemed to be at least uh, 11 key things that make our salvation possible. These are beliefs that kind of help you build the, the, the building of, of salvation. Right out of uh, <clears throat> Romans 1 through 3, that would be that sin's a problem, human depravity. Christ's virgin birth, right? Uh, that's at least indicating Christ's deity and his sinlessness. Um, Christ's sinlessness is connected there between 2 and 3. Christ's deity, his godhood, Christ also full humanity, God's unity and triunity, that God is one, but he has three expressions, um, the necessity of God's grace, the necessity of believing faith, Christ's atoning death, and Christ's bodily resurrection. Now, I want you to notice right up front, just like Paul, where Jesus is the center. Even when we start talking about God's unity and triunity, that's simply saying that Christ, right, Jesus Christ, the, 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 the Messiah, um, that most of these are over Jesus. That's always the dividing line is Jesus, his teachings and his life. Um, there's a lot of connecting points, basic connecting points between major world religions, a lot of connecting points. The real difference comes down to Jesus, his life and teachings. That's always where the discrepancy lies. So these are 11. Now, again, do you have to affirm belief in all 11 of these, right? R uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you have to confess each one of these and go, did I get all 11? Now, we're going to talk about what it takes for someone to be saved versus what it takes for salvation to work. This is the mechanics of salvation. So um, uh, Chris talked about justice last time. We're going to move to sanctification, which is your present power over sin in your life now. That the Bible also goes on uh, as you move past Romans, Romans 4 and 5, and Paul talks about you can have actually victory over present sin in your life progressively. This is called holiness or sanctification, to set something aside. So there's two under sanctification. Um, one is Christ's bodily ascension. Uh, why? Because the Bible says he bodily ascended and bodily rose. And then this is an interesting one too, but it's not as important as the, uh, as the 11 to salvation, but it's still important. Christ's present intercession for us. There are some theologians that say Christ making intercession for us is one of the most comforting doctrines in the entire Bible. But most theologians wouldn't put it as a, as a, a, the thing that has to happen and you have to believe to make sense of salvation, it has to do with holiness. So Christ is presently making intercession for us. We can pray to him as if we would God or through him to God the Father. Either way, we're supposed to be what? Moving on and increasing in righteousness. That's the whole idea through Holy Spirit power. And last is called glorification. Glorification. Glorification is, again, our present, or not our present, but our future abode uh, with God, that we'll be glorified with Christ. And that requires the last doctrine that we're going to talk about right now is doctrine 14, Christ's second coming and heaven and hell doctrine that comes with it. Now, the reason these are important is because there are some movements within Christianity that deny that you have a soul, deny that there's a hell. Um, they would say basically it's compulsory heaven for everybody. This is one of the main issues in progressive Christianity is any idea of judgment, sin, um, any idea of uh, God's wrath is they just kind of erase that out of the Bible. So I wanted you to be sure that these are uh, these are things that help make sense of our salvation. These are like building blocks to help us make sense. Now, again, if you witness to someone and they sub repent and submit their their heart and lives to Jesus, if they don't say, and I believe that Christ will come back again. If they don't say that at the moment, it doesn't mean they're not saved. We're going to talk about the difference there. But this is how Paul builds what salvation needs and what it's supposed to look like. Okay? So we wanted to work with these 14. And the, what, just so you know, the 14 that we're working with right now, there are actually two more we'll talk about that are more general sort of mind-based or conceptual uh, essentials that you need. But out of these 14, these are pulled right out of, of Romans 1 through 8. Romans 1 through 8. So I, I wanted to give these to you for consideration. When a preacher denies one of these 14, you should start listening really closely. 
these are, uh, I think you could make a case that these are essential um, uh, for the life of the, of the body of Christ, for the life of the believer. Um, but I wanted to ask and see if anybody had any comments on the first 14. So we got the 14 out there, and then we'll talk about uh, further thinking about these in a moment. Anybody got any questions about the 14? 14 essentials. Remember, if we don't know what the essentials are, we don't know what the non-essentials are. And so um, we, can, we can drift over into uh, what we call theological minimalism or even progressive Christianity if we don't know these. All right, moving on. Um, so I, you know me, I like doing a spectrum. This is a really great chart here to let you see um, where you might be on this. We want balance, but let me give you uh, the spectrum here. So on one side, and I actually, I actually prefer this side. I don't want to be an extremist, but I prefer this side because at least I know where somebody's coming from. There's one side called doctrinal, a doctrinal sectarian, somebody who is like, I love disunity. <laughs> I love finding problems with whatever somebody has to say something. If you're not in total lockstep with me on every issue, you're probably not a Christian, right? So um, this is called doctrinal sectarianism. Uh, another way of putting this is you're, you want to fight about everything always, all right? Now, again, at least I know where somebody like that's coming from. I don't want to be that, and I don't like that because the Bible, Paul talks about this as well. I don't know if you uh, if, if you start looking through the New Testament, whenever Paul starts talking about, like, for example, different gifts or different roles in the body of Christ, he always sets it up with a big unity. We're unified in Christ. We're one in Christ. One faith, one baptism. He always one, 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 and then he gets into the differences because he knows what will happen. Well, my gift's better than yours. My, my expression's better than yours, this sort of thing. So he knows we as fallen creatures flow towards what? Disunity, fragmentation, fighting, right? So on one side, you have this, the doctrinal sectarian. This is somebody who says, um, I'll fight about everything. Uh, I just talked to somebody that will remain unnamed about a week ago who said, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. If you're not speaking in tongues every week, you're not saved. And I went, uh. So um, I'm like, golly, that's a way to wipe away of the 2.2 billion Christians, a way to wipe away about 1.7 or 8 <laughs> billion Christians. But anyway, uh, yeah, somebody said that, they, that they, they put tongue speaking, that particular gift expression, as a barometer, a, an essential. The other side is doctrinal minimalism. Minimalism. Um, this is uh, a, 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 another extreme on the other side. Uh, idiomatically known as butter and sunshine. <laughs> you melt <laughs> over any issue. Um, or what's called a progressive Christian. Um, nobody can be sure, so whatevs. You know, this is the, uh, this is the kind of thing. And, and nobody wants to be like a, a person of disunity and a fighter and that sort of thing. They, you know, let's just get along, man. Uh, can't we all just get along? So um, this is what's called a theological minimalist. A theological minimalist. Uh, they would say, well, since these are theological claims and not scientific claims, who knows? Who's to say, right? So you just kind of become this kind of easy breezy Christian. I don't know, whatever, you know. Um, so I don't know where you fall on this. I would imagine many in our class probably fall a little bit more, ironically, to the left. <laughs> not, not the left-right euphemism, but uh, fall a little bit to the left than they do on the right on this. Um, but the, only, the reason I prefer that left side isn't because I love, hey, Pharisees for life. It's because, uh, it's, honestly, it's because I at least know where somebody's coming from that way. They give me something, we, a target we can talk about or something, as opposed to, I don't know, you know, you just love on them. Okay, true, you absolutely do. That's where you begin, not end, though, right? That's where you begin the Christian application. You don't end it there. Any question about the minimalists and the progressives versus the sectarian fighters? Uh, and anybody want to comment on that? Or uh, Either extreme is really unappealing. Um, but we're trying, to, we're trying to maintain a balance on this. Any, any question or comment about this before we move on? Nobody? <laughs> I thought somebody would say something about it. That's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, yeah, I uh, put this Babylon B uh, pretty good. Progressive evangelical leaders meet to affirm the doctrine of sola feels. Uh, this is how the solas, <laughs> the solas for Protestants are this alone. These are the most important things. So they have the five solas, sola God, Deo Gloria, God, glory to God, sola Christus, sola feed, faith alone, sola, spirit, uh, sola uh, scriptura, right, the scripture alone. Um, sola gratia, grace alone. So uh, the, for the theological minimalist or the doctrinal minimalist, it's what about feelings alone? <laughs> Don't they mean something? So anyway, it's kind of funny. All right, so two books I wanted to bring you right right away that are I, I think they would be great for your library if you, if you want to explore this even more. And one I just found this year, which is really, really cool, and I found it through 
I, a, a New Testament scholar I really, really respect. This is one of his students named Gavin Ortland. It's this book right here at the bottom, Gavin Ortland's book, Finding the Right Hills to Die On. Now, again, you're like, I don't want to die on any hill. But, the, but oh, that sounded weird. Uh, sorry about the voice. But Ortland is, is a student of a guy named Don Carson. Don Carson who teaches at Trinity Evangelical uh, Seminary and Divinity School in uh, Illinois. And it's a great, great little book. It's not too thick, but about uh, you know how you determine what are essentials versus non-essentials and then how you operate in those. So uh, we're going to look at these, but I wanted to bring you one of the things that Ortland uses is actually a term from a uh, the other books by a guy named Al Mohler, The Disappearance of God. He has another list of essentials versus non-essentials. Al Mohler is probably the best-known Southern Baptist scholar, pastor, president of Southern Baptist Seminary out there right now. He's a really, really bright guy. Um, but but Ortland uses one of Mohler's terms called triage. Anybody know what triage is? Anybody ever served in the armed forces and know what triage is? Okay, Uh Theological triage is a term coined by Al Mohler, the, the great Baptist scholar, and then taken up by Gavin Ortland in his book, Finding the Right Hills to Die On. And it's basically this, that, you know, we need to do theological triage. A triage unit is a, is a temporary unit in wartime that treats injuries from the battlefield and has to decide what is most important. You can't, you know, treat somebody for a hangnail and then somebody die because they lost all their blood. You have to treat the most essential things, the most important things right up front, right? So what we're going to do here is look at how we determine um, what would be considered theological triage. What are the most important things? What are hills to die on um, if you're going to fight for things? Because we live in a culture that says there's no theological doctrine, no biblical doctrine worth dying about. Now, we know that's not true because we know that an entire multi-million person denomination is about to split over one of these issues. And another one, the, the, the first largest Protestant denomination in the world, Baptist, are going to split as well over these issues. So we know they're not unimportant. So Ortland says there is a four a four a part evaluation grid for the different uh, essentials versus non-essentials. And he says the essentials are number one, and then two through four are the non-essentials. So let's look at what uh, Ortland says here, this theologian. Uh, doctrines that are essential to the gospel. Now notice we've been setting it up this way. Essential to what should be your question if you're talking about the essentials versus the non-essentials? Essential for salvation. Um, remember, we have this, uh, this Greek word soteria that means salvation in the Greek. So essential for salvation are big. So, for example, Trinity is pretty essential. Why? Why is God the way, God's, the way God is in his being essential for salvation? Because it's going to de- determine what you think of Jesus, right? If Jesus is just an interesting man, then you've got problems in your salvation doctrine. And that's not only true of Romans 1 through 8, Romans chapters 1 through 8. It's also true of... Uh, of how we determine essential versus non-essential. Number two, um, doctrines that are urgent for the health and the care of the church. Uh, doctrines that are urgent for the health and care of the church. So uh, the example that Ortland used, these are his examples, baptism. In other words, you may have a denomination divide over a non-essential doctrine, um, but it's, it's, and that is the, it's important for the health and care of the church, but it's not and essential. Now, you may think it, that's wrong. Maybe you think it is essential. Maybe you think that baptism is absolutely essential. If so, you should probably be at a Baptist church, right? Especially a Southern Baptist church. They're the only denomination that thinks part of everyone's salvation process should be a baptism. Um, so, uh, and just so you guys know too, you guys know the younger generation doesn't want to get into any of this. Uh, they have a very, very antiseptic view of denominations. I, I tend to think denominations are quite honestly, most of the time, harmless. Uh, maybe you're embarrassed by them. You know, they say, is there a difference between a, a denomination and an abomination? Um, but I actually think there's so much we have in common. I, I, I'm, I'm, I follow in the steps of Pastor Betzer. He was extremely interactive with other denominations, extraordinarily. And not only did he watch other pastors from other denominations, he interacted with pastors from other denominations. Heck, you guys know, he even went outside. He knew rabbis in town, imams in town, uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, Kingdom Hall runners that ran their Kingdom Hall in town. He, he had dialogue with all these people consistently. So, um, so yeah, uh, the second is that. But the younger generation doesn't like this. They see abomination uh, under the word denomination. They don't see more similarity than difference. Um, so, uh, so th- the younger generation tends to lean towards theological minimalism. Not only do they not know the essentials, they don't want to know them because that means they might have to right, fight or dis- disunify over something like that. So uh, that's number two. 
Number three, doctrines that are important for one branch of theology. Notice they're going in descending order here from Ortland. Doctrines that are important for one branch of theology or another, but not such that they should lead to separation. His example here is your view on the millennium, eschatology. Um, you really probably shouldn't leave a church if you have different views on whether the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or after the tribulation. I'm with Ortland on this one. I don't think that's something Christians should divide over. Um, I don't know where you put our primary, right? The, with Pentecostals, it's this. We believe the Holy Spirit can express himself in our services through human beings whenever he wants and in a variety of ways that are mentioned in the New Testament. Now, some go further than that, vineyard, charismatics, things like that, and say he can express himself in ways even beyond, because he's God, beyond even what the New Testament says are ways the Holy Spirit can express himself. So they'll, they'd allow in, charismatics allow in things like, well, if you're saying it's for Jesus, bark away, act drunk all you want, roll around on the ground, crawl like a snake. Um, I saw a, 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 a charismatic pastor once pull pages out of his Bible and eat them, because it says, it says, you know, you... The word's supposed to be nourishment for you. I'm like, that's a metaphor. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's that's uh, what we're talking about um, here. Uh, so, for example, I'll give you an example that, that you can at least think about, that you could chew on here. There was a, <laughs> don't do it again. There was a, um, <laughs> there was a gentleman that used to be part of our home outreach and part of this this class that did not leave our church over an issue he had with our head pastor. Uh, again, remain a name for now for the purpose of the illustration. But our head pastor, as you know, is big on Holy Land, Jews, Israel, them being still God's chosen people. We're grafted in as Gentiles under, under Jesus. Uh, but he had a real issue with how strong the church stood from our head pastor on the idea of the Jews still being the chosen people. We had multiple, two or three conversations. I think he might have even had a conversation with Chris about it as well. Uh, just keep going on and on. Now, he was not willing to leave the church over. There's too much good going on, too many friends, too great of a community for this particular person to leave, but he had a lot of problem with it. Why is this important? Ortland would put Zionism, the idea that, you know, because th that's the argument. The live argument is, are they still considered God's chosen people when they're less than 1% of the population and most of them are secularist now, right? So, do we keep calling them special and 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 uh, blessed of God, even if we have evidence of that? If we're all grafted in and now we're all children of God and all special in God's sight because of Christ, so this was a non-essential that really bothered him. Now, why is this important? Because even if something's non-essential, it touches other doctrines and other ways you understand the Bible, and it can really get to someone if something you don't believe is really represented in scripture well continues to be said over and over again in a church or in a body or in a small group, right? So believe it or not, non-essentials aren't, aren't uh, unimportant. They're not unimportant, but they're just not as important as doctrines connected to our salvation, okay? So this is one of those things, and, and again, because of his background, uh, you know, there was a, an antipathy towards Jewish people, um, towards Semitic people, Jewish people, because of where he was. You know, I don't know if you know, there's not a lot of love going on between Muslims and Jews uh, in northern Africa, uh, Egypt, or uh, in the Middle East. So, yeah, that was uh, one person X that uh, moved, not because of that doctrine, but, all, you know, wasn't going to split from the church, but had a real problem with that non-essential. Number four, doctrines unimportant to gospel witness and ministry collaboration, but still, you might think, are represented in Scripture. For example, uh, musical implementation. Uh, I don't know what you think about this, but you know uh, there are bodies of believers that have split over rug color, uh, pews versus seats. Um, there are some people that like a lot of musical instrumentation. There's some that don't want any. Um, you know, uh, Church of uh, Christ Nazarenes don't have any musical implementation. They're like it's all a cappella. No music, no none of that. They believe the Bible tells them that it should be just voices or nothing. Uh, so I don't know. Again, some some people there there's a diff there are differences we can have without dividing over. For example, if you're a person that likes more solemn worship, <laughs> you won't like most Pentecostal and charismatic services. But you might not like the solemn that's more reverential. You may like the feels like a rave in here. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's a little too far. But uh, we're trying to do extremes here, right? So. Um, but I, I don't know where you're at on these things, but this is where Ortland would say these are certainly 
level four are certainly things we should not, we shouldn't divide over. But a couple of things just to keep in mind. I, I know we're we're all logical thinkers, and most of us are. You know, I, I tell Pastor Russ, we're not. I get all the non-herd thinkers in here. <laughs> They're the ones that are really, you know, kind of think for themselves, and you know, are all about evangelism. But, but you might be tempted to go, well, if it's two through four, why worry about it? Well, non again, remember, non-essential doesn't mean non-important, right? Because one, we've already talked about non-essentials touch essentials sometimes for you, and how you understand essentials. Two, there's a history, right, that you can't ignore. Like, if you lived a couple hundred years ago and believed that baptism wasn't essential, you could be drowned for it or imprisoned for it. So we don't want to discount the sacrifices people have made for things that they thought were essential but didn't look like they were, uh, they turned out they were non-essential. And last, uh, it, it, it certainly doesn't mean it affects your entire view of Scripture. Because sometimes, if you think about it, are you really telling me there's only... 11 justification ideas and three more sanctification and glorification ideas in Romans that we really need to know, you know, because this could kind of look like an insult to the rest of the Bible, couldn't it? All the other are non-essential, but there's nothing non-essential in the Bible in the sense that we need all of it, right? We need all 66 books and all the inspired message from God to understand him and live our lives. But there are things that are essential for salvation that seem to be first order, things that Paul says are of first importance, okay? Even Paul, uh, puts a, a distinction there and uh, does this sort of thing. So I wanted to stop there, uh, and we'll get to two ways to evaluate here. If you actually have a question about a specific doctrine or idea, uh, we're going to have, a, there, there's a couple of different theologians I want to use here that are really, really solid. But uh, any questions about Ortland's one through four? Anybody have anything they wanted to add or things they wanted to comment about uh, his last category? Um, you know, again, churches have divided and Christians have divided over over these sort of things, uh, e even trivial things like this. Any question or comment? Anybody? Love to get you on film. All right, Bill, uh, Mr. McGreeley. Let's wait till we get the microphone to you, buddy. The way I oftentimes like to look at this is there are three major categories where Satan fights against the church and God. That is the nature and character of God. Secondly, the nature and character of man. And thirdly, the means of reconciliation between the two. Right. So all of the doctrinal misses, yes. the, the ones that are really an issue, can fall into those categories. Where, right. And, and uh, those are the things that Satan fights against. Right. And I think those are where we need to recognize where the errors are because it's our enemy that's propagating them. Right. But notice that Jesus... He hung out even with the uh, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, right, right, with the publicans and sinners, right. So that, uh, as you say, what Pastor Betzer did mm -hmm. was even reach out to people mm -hmm. he disagreed with. Because, for example, uh, I reach out to my neighbors, right, even right. though I disagree with them For on sure. many issues, yes. because uh, you know that's our way of being salt and light, right. <clears throat> Excellent. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, essential versus non. Um, a last reason to think not treat two through four in Ortland's list as unimportant is they, they sometimes they're, they're really important to you living a Christian life, that sanctification aspect, right? Very, very important. Um, so your, your life of obedience to Jesus uh, can be affected by what you think uh, is, is important in the word versus not. So there's a theologian. I don't, I think he might be a reformed theologian. He's got a funny name, Eric Theonis. Um, he's got, uh, uh, I thought these are one of the best I'd, I'd read, I'd seen over the last five or six years. He's got a criteria of eight to help you discern. Now, Ortland's got four. <laughs> Theonis has got eight. And then another uh, scholar I really admire, Wayne Grudem's got eight as well. And I'll give you Wayne's eight, but I won't put them on the screen. But I think the Annis are, are worth putting up on the screen and for us to, to look at very quickly. Um, and I wanted you to notice something about Eric Thoanis' his list of eight. It's bigger than Gavin Ortland, but he wants to make sure this is important. It's not technical precision. It's not like, did you say the words right? It's practicality. Practicality. Do you understand, can share, and live? Amen. So, you know, we're all about practicality here, and so is Eric Thoanis in his list. So the first, his first one is biblical clarity. Biblical clarity. Is it something clearly expressed that would be simple to understand, uh, very, very clearly expressed? There's not, it's not in a genre that's a little bit unclear, like it's not in a poetic genre. 
it's not only mentioned once, it's mentioned multiple times in multiple languages and multiple genres. So multiplicity of times it's mentioned, and is it clear when you see it? Um, that's one. Two, relevance to the character of God. Does it have relevance for how you view who God is? Does it have a relevance to how you view who God is? Uh, that's, uh, yet yeah, again, think about, again, church carpet <laughs> or seats versus pews. That has absolutely no relevance, right? Uh, it's only when somebody gets really psycho and they're like, God prefers yellow rugs, you know, this kind of thing, you know, that's happened before. So yellow's like the golden streets. I'm dead serious. That's the, the tortured logic. So, uh, number three, uh, relevance to the essence of the gospel, right? The gospel's how we're saved, the good news that has to be what, right? It's a response to the bad news. Um, so it's relevance or it's connection, right? To, uh, how close is it to your salvation? Um, biblical frequency we talked about under clarity as well, so that could kind of be collapsed in there, and significance. How often is it taught in scriptures? How many times do you see it? And what weight is it given? What weight is it given by the biblical authors? Is it given a lot of weight? Um, I think of a, 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 an, one where Paul mentions very, in 1 Corinthians, he mentions this weird passage about baptism for the dead, and the Mormons ran with it. But that's one, a one-off mention of a pagan activity that you can't pull into a salvation doctrine. It has no relevance to the character of God. It's not mentioned frequently. It's, it, it's unclear in the Greek what Paul is getting at there. So that's why we don't baptize, do what's called, what the Mormons call proxy baptism. That's why we don't get baptized for our dead relatives that were unsaved. Um, because Paul mentions it kind of as a sidebar uh, in 1 Corinthians, and we just we don't see it again. And it's very, very, it's very, it's a difficult passage. It's difficult in the Greek, and it's difficult to understand why Paul put it there. Number five, effect on other doctrines. The effect on other doctrines and consensus amongst Christians. That means historically and currently. Now think about, we've talked about the LGBTQ, uh, the, the whole alphabetized grab bag of subverters of culture and Christianity. Um, uh, we're, one of the points we've tried to make with people is you have to come to terms with the current consensus and the historic consensus. Even if we're going to wrangle over the 11 passages that mention something like homosexuality directly in the Bible and wrangle over the Greek versus the Hebrew, the, the, you know, is this under law, is this under grace, new covenant, old covenant, you still have to deal with the historic Christian community, those closest to Jesus and his followers and how the people that have been most faithful and have had the most cost attached to their belief, how they've responded to these issues with regard to the Christian life. And currently, what's a consensus going on? Um, so, for example, uh, if I'm running, thank God I'm not, but if I'm running the Methodist church, I go, no, look, right now we have about, eight, part of this discussion is we have about 80, 75 to 80% of Methodists that don't want this. So we're not fracturing over this. You can leave or stay, but we're not fracturing over this issue because consensus matters. Now, it can work in the other direction. If 80% come to you and like, we need to change, we need to change, we need to change, then you know you have to decide whether there's an essential and you're going to stand your ground on it. But the point is you have to deal with consensus, Christians past and present, past and present. Number seven, effect on your personal life and your church life. Your The effect on your personal life and your church life. Uh, this is an important one, but notice... Theanus has got this down the list a bit. These are in, in descending order. So uh, the, how you know whether a doctrine's essential or not, or close to essential, or how you place it, is how it has an effect on your life of the church corporately or the life of you personally. And then um, last would be, uh, or that, that's number eight. So um, again, this is a practical list. It's not a technical list. Um, but I wanted to give you these as a possibility of, of understanding how to how to determine if a particular doctrine happens to be essential or not. You could use Ortland's four-part uh, discernment. Uh, you can use Thoannis's eight. Let me give you, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but let me give you Grudem's eight as well. This is Wayne Grudem, probably one of the best-known theologians in the world uh, right now, evangelical theologian. So this is Wayne Grudem's, right? So this is what Grudem says churches should ask before they make major, major changes uh, in doctrine or understanding of the Bible. One, certainty. How sure are we that the teaching is wrong before we change it? How sure are we that the historic teaching is wrong? He also follows Thoannis and says, number two, the effect on other doctrines. And the, what, what's the question to ask with this one? Will this teaching likely lead to significant erosion of other doctrines? Uh, number three, effect on personal and church life. So he has this as number three, Grudem. Thoannis says it as number eight. Will this false teaching bring significant harm to people's Christian lives 
or to their uh, work that they do in the church. Number five, the perception of the importance amongst God's people currently. Is there an increasing, is there a cultural consensus? Is there an increasing consensus on the issue? Is this matter important enough for the false teaching to be explicitly denied in a doctrinal statement? You might have to make a doctrine statement that says this is where we are currently. That's number five, perception of the importance amongst God's people practically. That would be the consensus angle. Number six, purposes of the organization. Is the teaching a significant threat to the nature and purposes of our organization? That would be true of any business organization or church, right? Number seven, motivations of the advocates. Very, very interesting. Does it seem that the advocates of this teaching hold it because of a fundamental refusal to be subject to the authority of God's word, rather than because of sincerely held differences in interpretation based on accepted standards? So what's that mean? In other words, are the advocates doing this because they want to appease the culture? Or is there a real issue with an open issue in the Bible? Okay, very, very big. Number seven, motivation of the advocates of this type of change. Um, Does it seem that the advocates of this teaching hold it because of a fundamental refusal to be subject to the authority of God's word, progressive Christianity, doctrinal minimalist, or rather because of sincerely held differences in interpretation based on accepted standards in the Bible? And last, uh, number eight, methods of the advocates of this change. Do, Do the advocates of this new teaching frequently manifest arrogance, deception, unrighteous anger, slander, falsehood rather than humility? Openness to correction, reason, kindness, and absolute truthfulness. So the last is a really subjective criteria. But basically, Grudem, who's been at the forefront of advocating for a return to biblical authority against the pressures of the culture, would say you also want to look at the methodology of the advocates. Do they express those things you see, the fruit of the Spirit you see in Galatians that Paul talks about? Or do they often seem much, much more angry, divisive, Uh, you know, this would be on the other end as well, if you're a theological sectarian. You know, Jesus had, when did Jesus get most angry? When did Jesus pick a fight or scorch his opponents publicly? It was over three main issues. One is theological arrogance. I've got it all figured out, right? Uh, The second was over adding, adding things to God's requirement to come to him so that people would stay out. And last was hypocrisy saying one thing and living another way, religious hypocrisy especially. He had the most scorching words for those sort of things in his life. So, again, we want to look at the methods of the advocates both on either end of it, the theological minimalists, the progressive Christians, all the way to the other side with the the sectarians or the theological maximalists that treat every, even non-essential doctrine as if it's salvific. All right, I'm going to stop there and ask for any any, uh, comments and give you, I'll give you a short short version of saying, but are there any comments about Grudem's way of trying to understand if something is uh, an essential or where it falls in the list. We'll go with uh, yeah here, Melissa, and then uh, and then Grudem. So we have th- we have Gavin Ortland's four, Theanis is eight, and then Grudem's eight as well. So go ahead, Melissa. Um, I was just wondering about the consensus. Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm clear. Is it saying that if it's a consensus among Christians that it might be right or wrong that we should go with it or yeah, that, because that, there are certain things yeah. that yeah no it, it's clarity. it's down on the list a bit but uh-huh. it should be part of your evaluation right in other words if if someone's holding something that is radically out of the historic and current consensus of what Christians interpret the bible do you understand what i'm saying mm-hmm. then you right you don't do it but that's still down on the list right it's still closer to say okay well is this represented in scripture multiple times is it clear is this something in scripture that seems to be open to interpretation and doesn't affect salvation or doctrine of god or is it something that looks pretty clear and and how we know whether it's clear clearly by the people that look at the word the most know the original language the the communities of faith that have suffered and died for these beliefs you know you see what i'm saying so it's a, it's a part of the evaluation not the only thing because you're right that's a if it's just like What's the personality of the person? Well, that's not always, right? You're looking at generally these advocates, if they're offering something new, a new way of implementing or understanding the Bible, what do their methods look like and what does the consensus look like? But that's not the only thing. So it's one part of an evaluation. Follow up? So take it. Yeah. So if, like, now, uh, yes. there are a lot of lot of progressive cr- uh, Christians who sure. agree with the grab bag. Sure. Stated, um, yes, yes, yes. It doesn't really matter how many people think that's right. <laughs> um, in the Bible, For it's sure. very, very clear. So so remember, consensus is down the evaluation chart. <laughs> These yeah. are in descending order for a reason. Okay. Great, great point. Um, I actually think there's far more theological traditionalist than there are. You know, they just have a they they know how to use the the megaphone. Uh, right. 
but you're also it's also right to say the younger generation tends to be theological minimalist because not so much unity but they've been i guess inculcated to to believe that there's nothing really worth fighting over at all right no country you know only thing you fight over is what you find in your heart that you want to do. Then <laughs> you fight with people over how you express that expressive individualism. But yeah, at the end of the day, we submit to scripture, right? That that's that's the end of the day. But when you're trying to determine is this an essential versus a non, um, obviously how it's presented in scripture, what your view is of scripture, that's far more important than the than even the historic consensus. This is something Protestants said. One of the reasons we separated out from Roman Catholics is they tried to put the historic the historic the historic touchstones of Christianity alongside scripture as equal authority. And Protestants are like, no, nah, uh, uh, uh. So it's the same thing. The, the consensus of people is not put alongside scripture, right? It's help us determine which ones are essential versus non. And then the methods aren't either, right? Like, for example, you could have somebody that's saying truthful things but happens to be a really unpleasant person. I think of uh, probably one of the most effective evangelists in the late 20th century was Walter Martin. I met a, a guy whose uh, who's dad worked for Walter Martin. This guy was a New Jersey boxer <laughs> that became an evangelist. And he was, I mean, he sliced and diced brilliant. Um, but uh, I don't know if you've got his book. One of the books, the culmination of his life's work and his study and his expression is called Kingdom of the Cults. It's a great book. Um, but Walter Martin was an unpleasant <laughs> character in a lot of ways. If you talk to him, Christian, you're okay. But he would, I'll give you an example. Um, when he went to uh, when when Walter Martin went to uh, Salt Lake City to have an interaction with Mormons, he was one of the few Protestant Christians that had had somehow gotten access to a lot of their historic documents, Mormon documents. They had kept those under lock and key, and he had gotten access to them. The church was packed out, beautiful church, packed out. People sitting in the windows, standing room only, to hear Walter Martin, and 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 even professors from BYU came. And he noticed during, you know, he did an hour-long talk, and then he did a Q&A, and they said, well, how long are you willing to stay? He's like, as long as you want. So I think he did like three hours of Q&A. <laughs> and the, the professors from BYU would send their TAs and students up to ask him questions and try to trip him up, and he'd handle them, and then he'd point back and go, why don't you guys come up here? Why don't you get on up here instead of sending your students up? Now, again, that's unpleasant, right? But it drove him crazy that they were sitting back, and then he went and launched into this big thing about, you know, Jesus, you know, did this as well. The Pharisees would try to, you know, trip him up. He's like, you call yourself Jesus. But he really was, he, what he was saying was true. And his view of the Bible was one that was traditionally there. But he wasn't, you know, in, in other words, so so looking at a theological maximalist or a theological sectarian like Walter Martin, you wouldn't just look at the fact that he's unpleasant sometimes and oversteps the gentleness and kindness we find in First Peter 3.15. You know, be ready to give an answer for the hope you have within you as you set apart Christ as Lord in your heart, but do so with gentleness and respect. So uh, it's not a number one. It's part of an evaluation of where an essential or non-essential lies. So okay. fair? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, comment? Thanks, Melissa. Anybody else want clarity or anything like that? Yeah, let's go over here. I just wanted to, I wanted to ask, uh, you, you had mentioned about the younger generation being kind of against denominations. Yes. And I'm wondering, you know, if you have any thoughts about why that is. Yes, uh, they see it as useless. But I don't think that's because they're like, we're all about unity. I think they just, uh, any younger generation thinks the older generation gets too worked up over things. That's, that's true of any culture <laughs> across history. Um, but... I've heard young people call denominations abominations, and there is a mild point to be made in that. Have you heard the old the old statement? If Jesus, uh, if there were denominations in Jesus' times, it would be the mudites, the anti-mudites, and the speakites, right? He spoke and healed. He used mud and healed, and then he touched and healed. So you'd have the I'm the toucher denomination. I'm the mudder. You know, I'm the. Um, I know it's going to get wiped out and edit. They're not talking about the tough mudder, but you know what I mean. Um, but I think the reason they do it is they think it's useless wrangling. It's useless wrangling, and they've been, they've been, I think, churched into a youth culture. You know, one of the things you do in youth group is you don't get too technical, right? You lose the kids. <laughs> oh, I don't know what he's saying. Time for the, let's put the music up real loud. Um, uh, so they think that theological maturity is, is the thing that probably makes you a denominationalist, right? And, and since denominations agree on more than they disagree on, they're, they, they have an ant antipathy towards denominations. They think it's just factionalism. It's separation over non, uh, non-important. Now, I don't think they're non-important. And it's funny because I, 
I'm a Gen Xer, so I was like the question authority crew, like morons. Um, so, you know, skeptical about everything, except for the fact that I'm skeptical. But, but I don't see, I see denominations as guardrails. I really do. You have a group that you're accountable to about believing and expressing a certain way you believe that's important in the Bible. That's why Ortland put it as number two. You know, something like baptism, where we could say cessationism versus gifts. You know, it's, it's important. I'm just not sure it's essential. But I don't see denominations as unnecessarily factioned. You faction because you have accountability over certain things. I think this way. Um, our pastor of this church uh, had a lot of respect for the big Baptist pastor up the road before he retired and prayed with him all the time. So he thought the denominational differences were important but they weren't definitive to whether someone's a Christian or not, right? So um, I think the younger generation, A, it's based out of ignorance. I don't know the differences, so they probably aren't important. Uh, the people that seem most concerned about it are older than me, and <laughs> older people don't know anything. And then last, I'm all about unity, you know, and if that means it's unimportant anyway, so who cares? Um, but that also leaves them open and vulnerable to being misled in a number of different ways and in a number of different uh, venues and, and expressions. Go ahead, follow up. What what about uh, the thought about like institutionalism that they you know they we see institutions across the country yeah. that are be becoming corrupt and more corrupt yeah. and it's you know that so that okay so I'll, I'll just go this way so why did our head pastor also say I have a healthy skepticism of the bureaucracy of denominations absolutely so again we're working on that balance right <laughs> I think denominations serve a purpose and they're good uh, they also can like any human organization. Uh, have corrupt aspects. Um, would it be great if we could all get along, right, and all enjoy a service with the essentials being most important? And then, um, but here's the thing too: I also don't think unity is uniformity. I don't think someone's necessarily negative if they don't like the rock show and they want to pray something really somber with just voices and just, you know, or even silently worship. I don't think they're less of a Christian because they won't shout. You know, I, I, but that's that's a difference, right? That's a difference. But here's the here's the issue: you can have a difference in style without violating the substance, and I think that's important. Um, but the, people come to expect a certain thing with with Pentecostals, and they this is one of the things. You want know to see crazier is our um, our old head pastor used to say, "We're not charismatics," right? He'd say, "We're not all the way over there either." You know, like we're we believe in spirit expression, but. Oh, how, how do some theologians put it? Spirit expression with a seatbelt, right? So uh, a biblical seatbelt, big old seatbelt. So, uh, but he would say, we're not over there with the crazies. So, um, so, so it's, I, I think it's important, but you're right. It, you, can have, you need to have a healthy skepticism about it becoming overly bureaucratized, overly systematized, so that you're, again, you know, um, it, <laughs> where you're, uh, you're, you're dividing over, over the wrong things. Great, great point. Great point. I'm not sure. I don't know if I made it more clear or more difficult, more muddy. But anyway, um, I would give you Grudem's. I'll send them to you this week. Grudem's uh, how you determine these in a pinch. Actually, Grudem d d uh, drops them down to four. Drops them to, he can drop them down to four if you're in a pinch. Here's how you determine them. But go ahead, Chris. Oh, Mike, yes. Thank you, Peter. I think one of the aspects of understanding this from a younger generation, it is very, very difficult to express nuance. Yes. And yeah. your desire to increase maturity within a younger generation is to help them celebrate and appreciate those that are different from them in terms of expression. Yeah. You know, when someone expresses something differently, then they would express it to appreciate that but to also understand the differences between the essential foundational aspects of what people believe, that someone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God and is God is different than someone who believes in Jesus but sees him just as a, uh, you know, a secondary created angel. Mm. That their, the expressions could be exactly the same, mm. but the fundamental differences are such that you're building on completely different foundations and therefore the end result is going to be completely different. And that's the difficulty of trying to express and that's why we've gone through the things we've gone through yeah. in terms of the progressive Christianity and now trying to talk through the essentials. You have to know what's real and then be able to celebrate the expressions of that from different perspectives. But then how, how do you 
you know, nuance is something that this generation, no, this upcoming yeah. generation, has a, a has a really difficult time with. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a yes and or a yes but right. Um, we'll end on a little joke. I, I thought I'd put this acronym again. Got this off uh, <laughs> Babylon B. If you don't go to Babylon B, there but there, there's like four or five really funny Baptists that put these fake news line news headlines out. I might actually start doing it before class starts to have a rotation of these headlines because they're really, really funny. But they have a good acronym for theological minimalist or progressives called MUSHY. Uh, and he's, it's, it's a great acronym here. Make sure not to leave anything embarrassing. That's the M. Uh, you, under no, under no circumstances, are you to defy your culture. S, stay soft and pliable in all things and at all times. H, herald your moral superiority to everyone else because you're so open. And last, why, I don't know why I believe the Bible, laughing out loud. So, um, so anyway, we'll uh, stop there. But, uh, but yeah, worth talking about, worth thinking about, because there is a, a group of people that say, you know, evangelize all you want to atheists, Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Hindus. Really, the more insidious thing is the undermining of the church from within, uh, now, again, I do think there's far more reason to celebrate. There's a lot more, I think, theological traditionalists out there. They just don't, we don't shout it as loud and we don't uh, uh, profess it as widely um, online and things like that. So um, we'll pray uh, and finish here. But if you, again, if you need to get a, uh, Brooke, do you have the picture for today? Do you have the camera? If you want to get your picture for the wall board so we can know each other's names and try to figure it out, or if you need a, if you don't have a, I know that <laughs> I told Pastor Russ the, the name tags aren't really working. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but at least you can know somebody's name and get a picture for what will I hope soon be a, um, a directory for the church. We can take it against the white wall there with Brooks' camera. Brooks there if you want to get uh, your picture for the end again. It's not like we're not going to be tracking you or getting your blood type so or selling you Amway. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for their great minds. I ask you to continue to mature them in their thinking. Uh, and help them, Lord, uh, as they, they make the essentials and even the non-essentials not only important uh, but interesting to those that don't find it interesting or desperately want to move away from a th the authority of your word. I thank you for this and ask you to bless them this week with opportunities to depend on you and show you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.